How are we doing? Good. Will you turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 2? If you do not have a Bible, there is a blue one in front of you. Uh, that is our gift to you. You are welcome to keep that if you don't have a Bible. We would love for you to be in the Word. And if that's an obstacle for you, uh, that's our gift to you. It's a blue Bible in front of you. But turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2 as we get going. Um, how many of you have ever been in a pattern in your life only to have that pattern kind of stop suddenly, kind of extremely? Anybody? Okay, I'll give you a little story. So I used to not go to Disney World growing up. For all those who goes to Disney World, okay, you guys are spoiled. Okay, I used to go to a honey cabin, all right, in the middle of nowhere. This is my, I'm going to give you a little sense of my childhood. So I would go to a honey cabin with no running water and no electricity. Fact, I know, right? It's like 1800s. No, it was today, modern time. So we would have this cabin, and it was on this in bank. So it was uh, middle of a mountain, and it was just kind of a cabin off a mountain. And no running water and an outhouse. My mom loved it, let me tell you. <laughs> and so we would, uh, we would have, like, bears kind of checking out, you know, during the day. And then, like, you know, I'm an 8-year-old having to go to the bathroom at, like, 1 a.m. in the morning, contemplating, will I be able to defeat the bear? Right? Like, it was very, very shady. But one of the things we had to do was we had to get water. So there was this really narrow path down to this little spring, and we would have to get water uh, and then bring it up. Now, I had a bunch of brothers and sisters, five brothers and sisters, a bunch of foster siblings. So it was a lot of us in this little cabin, but we all had like a rotation. And so it was Johnny's turn. That's what they called Johnny. So I would walk down this path, this path and get water. Now, you would bring two buckets, right, because you're not a wimp. Your brother had two buckets. Come on, right? So you'd have two buckets. You'd fill those buckets up, and you would walk up this path with the water. And you'd have to walk up, and it was a pretty narrow pass. And so you'd be like, and you'd just kind of be balancing on your way up. And so we did this for years and years and years. Now, we didn't live there, but every summer we'd go, and we'd have to do it. So it was like second nature. Well, one day I was just tired, and it was my turn. I was like, oh, man. And so I went down, got the water, and, and I was holding the buckets, and I was walking up this narrow pass, and I fell down the pass. So my leg gave out, and I fell. And it was now, now the mountain was like this, right? So the buckets go everywhere, and I'm just free-falling, right? I'm like, this is it. Take me, Jesus. Right? I'm falling, <laughs> and I hit a tree. My body hits a tree, <sighs> like this. And I was, like, stuck on this tree, but this tree caught me, right? And so I'm laying there. The buckets went all the way down. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, i got to go get those buckets. And I'm just laying on this tree, and I'm just thanking God for this tree. I'm like, Lord, I'm so grateful for this, this tree. And then I literally climb on this tree and, like, jump to the next tree and get up on the path walk all the way down, get the buckets, and then I go back up, and I'm like, guys, guys, I fell. I almost died, but I'm a Superman, and I grab the tree, and I'm okay. And my mom and dad's like, well, you got to go get the water still. And so I had to go down again and get the water, and this time I didn't fall. But I remember this moment in my life because it was just very, very scary, very outside of routine. Anybody have a moment? Maybe you didn't fall down a mountain, but anybody have a moment where, like, something broke your routine? You get what I'm saying? And it just kind of was shocking because you were just so used to it. Okay, so Solomon is going to argue this conversation about. He's going to say, okay, your life is kind of a routine. And he's going to say you do a lot of things over and over again. In fact, this whole world is a lot of things that people chase after, that everyone has always chased after. And uh, you, you may not know this or not, but really the gospel is going to challenge that routine. It's going to take you away from being focused on this world. And it's going to change your way of seeing everything. But until you meet Christ, you're going to be in this kind of meaningless routine, Solomon is going to argue. And for some of you, this is going to be kind of depressing because you're chasing after something, only to find that today Solomon is going to remind you that that thing you're chasing after will, excuse me, will not satisfy your soul and will ultimately leave you disappointed. And he's going he's to argue that he has had those things that you're chasing after. And he's going to say, ultimately, there, there's meaninglessness in those things. And he's going to kind of bring this deep conviction over us as we read Ecclesiastes that, man, maybe we are chasing for joy in these things only to find. He says, no, if you don't turn to the Lord, if you don't chase after the Lord and his kingdom, you're going to leave a meaningless life. And so that, that is the, the kind of the conversation we're going to expand on today because the first chapter of Ecclesiastes was really about this chase. And he kind of broadly said, okay, a lot of us are chasing after these things, and he gave us kind of some examples of these things. But in chapter 2, he's going to get very specific about what he actually did, the things that he 
took at, chase after, only to find a conclusion in those things of meaninglessness. So in chapter 2, we're going to lay the stage. Okay, this is a wisdom literature. So in the scriptures, there's wisdom literature, and this is one of them. Uh, it's written by Solomon, who has been given divine wisdom from the Lord. He is looking at the world, and he's testing the world. Now, Solomon is more famous than anyone in this room will ever be. He is more good-looking. He is more powerful. He is more wealthy. He has a lot of things that you and I will never have, but we're chasing. Do you understand this? Like, this is the author. So take our world and say, okay, it's a combination of Elon Musk and Bill Gates, and he was all of those guys in one. This is who's writing this. So if you think for a moment as we read this, I'm going to get more than this man had, and that will satisfy me, you will never obtain what he has obtained. He has run further and faster and longer after these things than you will. Does that make sense? So those who have a house, his was bigger. Those who had a really prestigious job, he was more famous. Those of you who are really good with the opposite sex and you just want to date and have sex, he had thousands of women at his disposal. Make sense? Okay. So let's get after it here together. And here is the main thesis of Ecclesiastes. Stop chasing the world. Start chasing the kingdom. This is the point of the series. To get your eyes off the world and put it on the kingdom. Because if it's on the world, you are going to be greatly disappointed and your soul, look at me, will continue to starve. So look what he says. This is important, church. Pay attention to the wisdom that God's word is giving us here. Stop the pattern and pay attention. This is really important. Look at verse 1. I said in my heart, come now. I will test you with pleasures. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this is also was vanity. Verse 2, I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use of it? But I searched my heart to how to find cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, so I might see what is good for the children of man to do under the heaven during a few days of life. Okay, he's saying, the first thing I did in this kind of, I had wisdom, but I went after the world project. He said, I chased after temporary pleasures of this world. So what did he do? Solomon said, I'm going to start to have parties. So everyone in this room, find yourself here. Solomon said, I'm going to do what the college kids do. I'm just going to get drunk, have a bunch of parties. And because he was who he was, he had as much food, as much alcohol as humanly possible, had as much people come to the parties. He said, okay, so I started by just having parties. He said, I had party after party, and the parties got bigger, and there was more people, and there was more musicians, and there was more laughter, and more alcohol, and I got drunk, and I did that over and over and over again. And he's going to say also that in that, he had to go bigger longer, and in that chase, the parties got bigger, 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 only to find a divine discontent in that thing. So, so, so let's ask this question, okay? Is the Bible true? How many of you have chased after the pleasures of the flesh, getting drunk, only to find that when you got older, you were just done with it? Or some of you saw these movies, saw these things about the expectation of teenagers or young adults, or maybe some of you are still chasing after parties, thinking that's going to somehow satisfy you. Like that's the best thing in your life right now is getting drunk with your buddies on a Friday night, and that's you. Solomon says, listen, I, I kept doing that and doing that and doing that, only to find myself being bored, and it was just shallow. Anybody ever find yourself in a party, and you look around, and you're like, no one is real. Like, everyone's just pretending, everyone's fake, I'm fake, I'm not even real with these people that are my friends, and it was superficial and shallow, and you just got, you just got sick of it, because it let you down, it wasn't what you thought it was, it was just what you thought you were supposed to do. Is he speaking to anybody here? He said, I, okay, I played that game, and some of us, we could raise our hand and say, yeah, we played that game too. Just chased after parties and pleasures of the flesh. And he just did that bigger, 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 only to find, you know what, I'm done with that. Like some of us, we have children, and then we look at our children, and we're like, hey, we want moral children, so we're done with that party scene. Let's take them to church. And look at me, if you're here because of that, welcome. And we're glad you're here. But here, here's the thing. By being here because you want your children to be raised with good morality, we hope you encounter Christ. So if you're here because of that, stay here. 
But we want you to encounter Jesus because if you meet Jesus and he transforms your life like he did mine, your whole family changes. And it's not about morality. It will be about a relationship. But if that's why you're here, you're just done with the pattern of the world of just getting drunk. Now you have children and you want to have morality. You're welcome here. I'm glad you're here. Christ offers more than that. But Solomon agrees with you. Yeah, that gets old. Everyone understand? Okay, this is the first thing he said. He's just chasing after the world. Chasing after the things that the world tells you is the place to go for joy and happiness, only to find that it was a divine discontent. Like, I'll tell you a story of something that rocked me. That was my pattern, too, before I knew Jesus. That was my pattern. Do what the world tells us to do. Fun has an alcohol in your left hand and a shallow laugh with a party. This is fun. And I remember being in that routine, and all of a sudden I met Christ. And I'm like, I don't want this community anymore. They don't care about me. So I remember telling my older brother who's walking with Jesus, is this all there is to friendship? And he said, no. There's actually gospel-centered community. Let me show you one. So he took me in the car. We were in Lancaster. Drove me to this house. It was a couple who li- literally had just a ministry of having young adults come to their home, and they just loved on them. Just purely loved on them. Introduced Jesus. Introduced what a godly family looks like. And so they brought us to this house. And I walked to the backyard. Big fireplace. A bunch of awesome people. Like, they were just very interesting. Traveled the world, played multiple instruments. They were just well-rounded. And they were all sitting around this circle, playing, loving on each other. And I remember walking in and just saying, what in the world is this? There wasn't an alcohol in anybody's hands, but they were, like, laughing. And they were genuinely interested in who I was. And so then all of a sudden they were talking about, like, politics and history. But not in, like, a way that the world told you, but but in, like, a biblical, Christ-centered view of things. And, like, the husband and wife was, like, sincerely in love, outdoing, you know. Like, there was no gossip or slander or, like, what did she say about me? Like, none of that existed. And I just remember getting punched in the face with a gospel-centered community and being like, what in the world is this? But it was so attractive because I was so used to the pattern of shallow, present something, and hide world. And Solomon is exposing that world to say, hey, if that's your world, there's more. But, but if that's all you think there is, you're going to be very discontented with that. That's meaningless. And then he goes on. Look what he says. He says, after that, he moved on to projects. Verse 4. Okay, I made great works. He said, I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I, I made myself gardens and parks. I planted them of all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools for which to water the forest of growing trees. I brought male and female slaves. I had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions. I had herds and flocks, more than any who had ever been before me in Jerusalem. I gathered myself silver and gold and treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and female, many concubines, to delight of the sons of men I had, and I went after. Okay, what did he do? Projects. How many of you found that divine discontent with the shallow party world, and then you went after projects? Some of you still are. Here's, here's what he said. Okay, for those in this room who are going after building stuff, Solomon said, I build everything you can imagine. Imagine being a person without any financial restrictions, what he thought he built. I want this mansion. I want this castle. I want this temple. And he had the slaves and the resources to build anything he could imagine. I want gold. I want silver. I want it to look like this. I want pillars. Anything his mind wanted, he created. In fact, you can go to Jerusalem and still see his pools that he fed his gardens with. He did this. In fact, I want to show you a picture. Okay, here's what he did. Up here is just some modern versions of the temple and some of the places he built. So so he built these massive buildings. Took years and years and years. He envisioned and he built. He not only built for himself, but he built for his wives too. 300 wives, massive mansions. But I want you to point out something. This is modern day. This is kind of what he was doing. Is there any difference? Come on. He says, okay, I I tried this idea of, man, if I just had this beautiful home in this location. He's like, I I did that, guys. I built. I built these buildings. So so anyone in this room, Solomon's offering you this amazing gift. He's saying, if you think a nicer house, an addition, heated floors, whatever will bring your soul satisfaction, look at me, it will continue to starve. I built those things. 
And those things, building things are not bad. But if your identity and your joy is associated with having those things, you will be let down. Solomon is going to promise you this because he's built bigger, better things than you will ever build. Make sense? Okay, let that truth hit you. For those who are in the project, lie right now. These projects that I'm chasing will bring me satisfaction. They will not. Here's another thing. Do you see what he said? He says, I have tremendous fortune. In fact, I chased after wealth. So I had slaves and flocks and herds and silver and gold. So he chased, okay, those right now, what's the lottery up to? I just had a conversation out in the cafe. What's the lottery up to? Some of you perked up. You see your heart? No, seriously, (laughs) right? What's the lottery? What's the lottery up to? I don't know, but it's a lot. I heard it was a lot. Okay, I want to use this example. I I heard, heard this. Okay, Solomon won the lottery. Okay, picture yourself. He won it. I had hundreds of millions. In fact, he probably had billions. When, when he comes to church history, he probably had in the billions, right? Maybe even the trillions like he, he just had. So, so he had that. So in your mind, you're like, right now, what would you do with $500 million? Oh, right? My wife's like, I pay off my debt. I'm like, no. I would like, no, <laughs> like, ah, debt, right? Some of you are like, no, I would, I would build or no, and like you, you chase, but, but ha- as we see, truth is you would win the lottery, and in fact, that would be a dark, dark thing for most of us in this room because you would have the money you'd want for your whole life, and you would buy some nicer things only to find that void is still there, and that's a dark place, isn't it? In fact, we, we see stories of people winning lotteries and giving it to their children, and the children waste it, and they look at, back and they say, what? I wish I didn't even have this. Because money with, it, with a broken heart that, that is a searching soul is going to leave more destruction than anything. So, so, so he's saying here, I had money, and it didn't do that. It didn't satisfy my soul. Look, he said, I also collected. For those who are a collector, he said, okay, I also, I was, I was the number one king in kings. Like, I'm telling you, like, he was like, Every king wanted to be like Solomon, and so he said people would come to me and give, them, give me the most rarest gifts of their kingdom. They would say, this is what our kingdom is known for, and he would get prizes and gifts, and, and, and he would get offerings of these amazing things from all over the world, Pr- art pieces and rare jewels. He would get all these things, so he collected the rare stuff of the world only to find the same conclusion. It just didn't satisfy me. So if you're a collector, if you just want that car... Man, if I got that car, oh, nope. Come on, Solomon, really? Because I really want that car. <laughs> nope, I had, it. I had the rarest things in the world. Okay, so projects. A new home, nope, won't do it, church. A pool, addition, better land. Okay, retirement financially. Okay, if I invest in the stock, if I have Bitcoin or no mortgage, that's, man, if I can just obtain that, nope. Okay, what power. If I climb the ladder of my corporation and I become my own businessman and I don't have any bosses, then he says, nope. Okay, what about, a, man, if I have a boat and clothes and uh, more, more Amazon packages? No. He says, no, no, no. Okay, se- sexual fantasies. All right, if I just it was younger or different or she treated me differently. or Man, look at me. He was uninhibited sexually, and he says, it's not there. It's not there. Stop thinking your life will be better if sexually things were different. It wouldn't be. The void will remain. And so you see these men in this world who have all these women around them thinking that this is like they've arrived only to know based on the revealed word of God That man is a scared, coward with deep insecurities. He's trying to fill his identity with people and women, only to find that he is just as lost as when he had none of them. This is the truth that we have been blessed with, is a lens to see the world the way it actually is. And again, some of you, you're getting bummed out. 
But here's the amazing thing. As we turn the eternal lens on in our our minds, like when we see the world through the blood of Jesus, through the kingdom of God, that this is not our home, that we are internal beings, when we flip that lens on and we see the things the way God sees things, here's the thing. All of those things are not bad in themselves because our hearts won't be attached to those anymore. So I'll give you an example. Anything you see in the future here, if I'm still a pastor of this church, in the future, anything you see that we build onto, if we do an addition, if we fix a room, it is not about building that thing. Because you and I know when Jesus comes back, that's not coming with us. So we're not going to build our own kingdom and our own castle here only to say, look what we build. We're going to say, will this bring souls to the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus? Will this build the kingdom of God? And we will build with the intention of building the kingdom of God. If it builds our kingdom, we want no part of it. It's meaningless. But if, if what we do here and the financial resources and the focuses will build something that will win souls to Jesus, we're in. Because eventually, somebody's going to want to paint the walls we painted. Eventually, this wall will be rusted. These nails will need to be replaced. This foundation will crack. So we will not idolize things. We will use things for the glory of God because we have been taken away and rescued from that chase. Amen? Does it make sense? So if I'm blessed with an amazing home, a beautiful home, God is not going to say, give that to the poor. No, no, no. He has given you that. That's a blessing Maybe some of you are really good with finances, so you have wealth. That's a blessing. God has gifted you in that area. But you're going to see your home as a tool for the kingdom. If it's a tool for your happiness, man, it's a waste. If I can't tell you how many people, I mean, Paul had senders, church. Paul had senders. People who were just feeding Paul for kingdom. And, man, that is powerful. And I'm going to use everything God has given me and give it right back to him. And this is what Solomon says. If you don't give it back to him and you make it about yourself, you're going to have a divine discontent in that thing. Look what he also chases. Verse 9. So I became great, surpassing all who before me in Jerusalem. And all my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desires, I did not keep from them. Think about that. I kept my heart from no pleasures, for my heart found pleasures in all my toil. This is really important. And this was my reward for all of my toil. So he says, okay, I chased after being the greatest person who has ever lived. And he said, I achieved it. I achieved it. I was the person that all the kings looked up to. Come on. And he says, but yet there was this amazing thing where he said, in the midst of all of that, the wisdom that God has given me remained in those things. Like, I'll give you an example of, I think, what Solomon was, was explaining here. How many of you have tasted and seen that the Lord was good? Maybe as, as a young age, you tasted that he was good. And then you chased. And in that chasing, you were at that party, that one night, come on, look at me. And you were looking around, and you knew. You knew. Or maybe you were... You were on that drug, or, or, or and, and, but you knew God was like, no, 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 I want, I want you. This isn't where I have you, and there's that in you. You just knew this is not where I'm supposed to be. Anybody? Okay, he says, so in the midst of all of this chasing, he just had this wisdom. He just knew the folly in the midst of being in it. That's so human. I'm so grateful that the Bible speaks to truth. It's so human. Like how many of you have been in a sin only to know it was sinful and destructive? You're in it, but yet, you know, he says, all the while, this was in me. And so here's what Solomon was blessed with, with most people in this world who haven't tasted and seen that the Lord is good yet. They're not blessed with. Follow me here. Solomon is going to make an argument that the, the most dangerous thing that could happen in your life for those who don't know Jesus is for you to get everything you want. I'm going to say that again. For those who don't know Jesus, the most dangerous place in your life you could be is getting everything you desire. He says that would be a really dark place for you because in that obtaining those things, that void would remain and you would be lost, alone, and terrified. Like I'll give you an example. Celebrities often are men and women who chase after being praised by men. But if you become a celebrity... And you realize you can't go outside of your door. 
and everyone wants to take your picture, and you ultimately obtain this fame that you reached, Solomon's going to make an argument that is a dark, dark, dark place. And in fact, we know that because what happens to most celebrities in our culture that we idolize? Drugs, depression, suicide follows. And we're, comp- we're perplexed. Like, wh- why, would they, why would they take their life? They have everything. They actually have nothing, Solomon said. Here's another one. Wealth. We just talked about this. You're actually getting the money that you want, and you still have that void and that anger in your heart. What a lonely place that is, where a car and a boat won't fix that. You're stuck. Like, like here's another one. What happens when you finally get retired and you look around and you say, this isn't what I thought it was? It's dark. It's lonely. It's depressing. Pro athletes. This is one I resonated with as a young man. When God revealed this to me, I completely lost my passion for sports. It's really, and again, you can have your passion for sport and use it for the glory of God. God just brought that away from me because of this truth. If you're an athlete and you become a pro at whatever sport you're chasing after, you become an Olympic champion, you become a pro athlete, there will be a moment you look around and you'll say, really? This is it? And you don't think I'm, I'm right here. You, you, think, you think this is a lie. Now, the world's not going to tell you this because the world's like, no, I like that you're chasing. You're going to give us money. You're going to give us your heart. So they're going to encourage the chase. But if you don't think this is true, pay attention. Tom Brady, I've been praying for that man. I don't know that man. But here's a man who's in a dark place. Why? Because he is the, one of the greatest, if not the greatest quarterback who's ever played the game, whose family's crumbling around him. And I mourn him. I pray for him, that he would encounter Christ. But you know what's fascinating about him? Is years and years prior, he had an interview. And he mistakenly showed the world this divine discontent that he had. And Christians pointed this out, but I I would argue our our job is to run towards that soul. But I want to show you that interview. I want you to see the chase in him. So that what Solomon's words, what he's saying is still relevant to our culture today because it's a human heart issue. Look at this. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and, and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life is me. I thank God. It's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't. This can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it. I'm 27. And what else is there for me? What's the answer? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I mean, it's... I think that's part of me trying to go out and experience other things. But there's a... I know. I love playing football, and I love being the quarterback for this team. And But at the same time, I think there's a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find and different ways of expression, being around. I know what ultimately makes me happy are family and friends and positive relationships with, with great people. And I think I get more out of that than anything. Did you see it? Did you see it? Okay. So again, we're, we're, not, we're not picking on this man. In fact, we should pray for him. But, but our world idolizes him. We, we, we think, you, you are married to a beautiful woman. You have multiple Super Bowl wings. You are wealthy. You have great looks. Come on, Solomon's like, I'm that guy. And there has to be more. Man, what, what an amazing, hard gift Solomon is giving us. Solomon could be like some parents <laughs> and say, you just got to figure it out on your own. But he doesn't do that with this book. He says, no, no, I'm going I'm to warn you. And that's why it's good news. Look what his verdict is, verse 11. Then I considered all that my hands have done and the toil I had expanded in doing it. And behold, all was vanity, a striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained 
under the sun. Whew. All right, that's his conclusion. If it's just that, if your life, guys, is about getting that job, getting married, having the house with a white picket fence, retiring, and then dying, he says it's, it's like chasing the wind. Okay, Solomon, what do you got for us? That's pretty depressing. Okay. He's saying, okay, church, you have, you have a decision to make. For those in this room, and there are many who have not placed their faith and trust in Jesus, you are chasing right now. You have to be. And I don't blame you. Like, here's, here's the thing. I don't blame you. Because if you notice in this passage, he says there were ple- there's pleasures in those things. So don't, don't misunderstand me. There are temporary pleasures associated with those things, and that's why we chase those things. It's, there's pleasure in not being alone. So you chase after relationships because you don't like to be alone, only to find divine discontent in that relationship down the road. There's pleasure in buying the new iPhone only to find the iPhone becomes old after a while. So there's momentary pleasure in those things. And the reason I don't blame you is before you have your soul satisfied in Christ, that's all you have. Now it's meaningless, but it's all you have. And so I get that the people who don't know Jesus are chasing those things. But church, if we do, well then we have a different conversation. We have a what in the world are you doing that's eternal or stop doing it. Like here, here's Solomon's argument, and I believe this is true. This is powerful and real, but listen to me. This is true. Anything you do, I'm going to say it to myself because I'm in this world with you. Anything we do that is not for the kingdom of God is a waste of time. Anything we do that is not for the kingdom of God is a waste of of time, okay. Whew, there's a lot that I do that is not for the kingdom of God. It's for my kingdom. It's for my, ten- like, okay, Lord. Whew. But, but how, how, do I, how do I move towards the things that I do and the things that I have been given that, that, that they are for the kingdom of God? Okay, he, here's, here's the challenge in this room because I, I know there's a lie that's coming right now that the enemy's putting in this room. I know there is. Here's the lie. I'm never going to tell pastor this, but I've tried God. And I was, I was disappointed like I was in everything else in this world. Maybe that's you right now. Like, I've tried God. I tried this God thing, and it didn't bring me that satisfaction that you say it's good to bring me. I tried religion, Pastor John. It's the same as everything else. I'm still lost. Here is the hope I'm going to give you today. You did not taste and see that he is good. You did not. That's not religion. And what I mean by that is if we're, if we're real and I ask those who said, I tried God. If I said to you, be honest with me, how many days do you start by waking up, opening the word, like actually opening the revealed word, having a journal next to you and seeking truly the presence of God and the relationship with God that he has offered you? How many have actually done that? I've tried the Lord Have you? Have you really leaned in? Would you just increase your church attendance? Come on, like, have you really sought and tasted and saw that that satisfaction come when you leaned into him? Have you really, truly cried out in prayer to the Lord? Have you? Because, listen, I, I know for a fact if you have, you will know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that the world doesn't touch the relationship that God wants for you. It just doesn't, there's, there's no comparison to that. Amen? Like the, what the soul, how satisfied your soul is to be loved and to love. And when you find that, does the temporary pleasures of the flesh still tempt? Yes, but, but you're not confused. You're just battling And so so the practical application is if you've never truly leaned into the Lord, you have to. Because beyond him and knowing him, you have meaninglessness. It's like, I I talk about repentance all the time. When you chase after the world, it's more things. It's a better house. And then we talked about this during the God With Us series when I first came here. Is that you get to this point where you know that the world can't satisfy you. And for some of us, we then go further away from God by numbing that, uh, that, that void. 
Like we know that people betrayed us, relationships betrayed us, our jobs betrayed us. So now we're just drinking ourselves to death because we're numb. And repentance is, you know what, I'm done going down that path. I'm just done. And it's turning towards God. It's not that you will not still be where you were, but now you're turning towards him. And everything you're going to do is, okay, I'm still this person. I still battle with alcohol, but I'm going to step towards grace. I'm going to step towards the forgiveness that he's offered me that I'm unworthy of. I'm going to step towards his mercy, step towards his love. I'm going to cast my shame and anxiety. I'm going to place that on the cross. I'm going to continue to lean in, continue to love. I'm going to continue to crawl if I need to towards the Lord until he comes home. And this is the gospel. It's men and women that are like, I'm just going to turn and chase after this instead of chasing after this. Because I know the more I chase after this, the further I get from the Lord. This is repentance, turning. That's why I said, have you ever truly turned? Or are you just asking God to make this mess that you're heading towards and to fix this mess? He's like, no, no, I want your heart. I want your heart. I don't want your behaviors to change. I'll change your heart. And in his grace and mercy, as we draw near towards the Lord, our desires for those sins and the worldly things will dim. The more we draw near to him, they will dim. I used to love wealth. Now, because I'm pouring into, I'm seeking the Lord, I do not idolize wealth the way I used to. He will grow those things dim as you draw closer to him. Guys, this is where victory is found. And some of you think you're in this battle and you just think God is there for heaven like, when you get to heaven, then you'll have joy. No, no, God is offering you joy as you turn. The more you draw near to the Lord. And so, so church, here's the greatest news that we've been given. Solomon says, turn around, turn around. Stop chasing. And what a blessing. What a blessing the gospel is. Because, listen, if it wasn't for the gospel, there would be no hope for you. Like, like feel that. If it wasn't for the, this is why the, the, Christianity isn't a religion, guys. It's the hope of the world. If the gospel isn't true, we have nothing but the chase. Nothing but the chase if the gospel isn't true. But if it's true, we have been rescued from the meaninglessness. In fact, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you are of this world. In fact, you are made eternal. What an amazing news that is. That this is not your home, the Bible says. That in Christ you have been given an inheritance that is eternal. Eternal relationship dwelling with the Lord that's going to satisfy your heart. This is the promise we have in the gospel. And so we can lean into that now. So Lord, you take my health. You take my home. Come on, Job. You take my family. You take all the things in the world, man, I still can rejoice, I still can praise you. What a gift. So here's the thing. As a church, I, I think there is a, a, an act, like I think there's a needed response, and I, and I was on my knees last night with this response. It's like all of us have to just give the Lord the chase that we're in right now. We just have to give it to him in prayer. I, I would encourage you, as we step into communion, whatever that is, okay, it doesn't mean that you don't even have those things. You just got to give him that chase. Like, Lord, I'm just going to give you the thought that that's going to satisfy me. I'm just going to give it to you. It won't. And I'm going to understand that, and I'm going to receive that, and I'm going to turn my eyes towards you. I'm still going to be faithful with the gifts you've given me. I'm still going to work for your glory, but I'm just not going to put my hope in those things. All of us who are in Christ Jesus need to offer that back to the Lord. If not, then the enemy has us in this really dark place of chasing. So we all can do that in some way. Some of these things, one or two of them had to resonate with you. Like for the single, man, when I have that relationship with that person, give that to the Lord. You don't need a relationship with somebody to have a satisfied soul. You need Jesus. Give that to the Lord. For the person who lost their job, man, if I just have a job again, give that to the Lord. Don't chase after that because that's going to shape your identity. You're going to feel like you're not valued. Give that to the Lord, or the enemy will use that to pull you away from him. And so what we're going to do as a church is very simple. We're going to enter into a time of communion, and here is why communion should never be a routine. It should never be something we do because we are told to do it, and it becomes a pattern just like everything else in the world. Because then it's meaningless. But here is the power of a communion. And I love that Jesus gave us this. 
When Jesus was sitting around his, with his disciples and he saw the men and women in that table, and most of them he knew that they were heading towards martyrdom. Most of the people in the table, church, were killed for their faith. He knew the physical turmoil that they were heading to, the fact that the world would turn on these men only to find that these men would transform the world. Think about that. The world's going to turn on these men, and the men who will receive that persecution will change the world. He knew that, and he knew the battle. And so he said, listen, I want you in the midst of this battle of keeping your eyes on me. I want you to remember me because if you don't, you will chase after the world. I know this to be true. So communion is our reminder to take our eyes off the world and to place it on him. Christmas is a reminder of getting our eyes off the world and placing it on him. We gather every Sunday. Why? Because we have come battling the world, and we want to be reminded that he is good. Amen? That he is good. That he is faithful. That he is loving. That he is slow to anger. This is our hope. And so as we do this, I want you to remember him. Remember for some of you where you were before you met him. And you worship him for the hope he gave you. And so Jesus took the elements and he took the bread. And if you guys are new with us, there's a little tab at the bottom of your cup. That's going to get you bread. And if you don't have a communion element, if you forgot, uh, please just raise your hand and we'll be able to get you one here in the back. But if, if you remember, he paused. And again, this was before his betrayal. Judas was there. And he broke the bread, and he knew, he knew he authored life. He knew that in, in our living, we will eat, we will drink, it will sustain us. And so he brought the bread up, and he said, how, how, as often as you eat, think about that. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. I was willingly to die for you because I loved you and I want to rescue you from that meaningless. He says, do this in remembrance of me. So church, if if you don't know him, don't do this. If you're new with us, we love you. We want you here, but you do not know Jesus. Don't do this. Don't pretend. This isn't just something the church does. This is real. This is a reminder of what he's done for us, what he's rescued us from. So those who are brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a privilege. So I will invite you in this moment to say a word of prayer and to do this in remembrance of our Savior, our hope. Thank you, Lord. In the same way, he took the cup. It's amazing to think about the atoning work of Jesus and the blood, the needed blood, to cover our sins. So willingly knowing that he was going to die, and guys, let's remind each other of this. The Roman crucifixion was one of the most horrific ways a human being could die. It was not easy, it was not comfortable. The author of all willingly stepped into that world into that flesh and into that pain so that you don't have to chase anymore. Come on. Every time you chase, you make a mockery of what he did for you. This is the human condition is that we forget the amazing grace we have been given. So don't. He says, this is my blood. Church, say a prayer. And do this in remembrance of our Savior. Lord, keep our eyes on you. As we worship you, give us a posture of worship. Lord, as Frank shared, this is the only proper response to the love and the grace and the rescue that was offered to us. We love you, Lord. We thank you for rescuing us from a life of meaninglessness. And that we live as eternal beings, prepared for eternal glory. 
consummated kingdom to come. And we worship you with that hope and that truth in spirit and in truth. Amen.